Our sermon lesson for today comes from Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who, di- who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is God's word. Well, a couple years ago, a book came out called Atomic Habits. I'm guessing most of you have at least heard of this book. It was one of the most popular books in the country for a long time. It might still be one of the most popular books in the country. And I have to be honest, I haven't read it. But I've heard so many people talk about it, and I've listened to a podcast interview with the author where he explained the main concepts of the book. And, and the concept that I hear most often from this book is this concept that every action you take is a little vote for the kind of person you one day hope to become. And I think that's a helpful thought. It's a, a thought that seems to have helped a lot of people. This idea that, that these little actions accumulated over time can can one day make a big change. I think that's helpful because it helps you realize that, that if you decide, you make this little choice to go to the gym and lift some weights one day, that's a, a small choice, and the next day you wake up, you look in the mirror, you're not going to look much different. But if you make that choice over and over and over and over again over the course of a year, by the end of that year you'll probably notice some pretty big results. If you make the little choice to read 10 pages of a book, you wake up the next day, you're probably not going to even notice. You look at your, your marker in the book and it barely moved, just 10 pages. But if you read 10 pages every day for a year, you'll be surprised how many books you can read. You'll be surprised at all the insights that you gain. If you make the little choice to spend 20 minutes talking to your spouse or to a friend instead of 20 minutes watching Netflix, you wake up the next day and you might not notice any difference. But if you do that every day for a year, your relationship will be exponentially stronger. These tiny changes over the course of a long period of time can make really dramatic uh, results. And that idea has helped a lot of people. It's one of the reasons this book was so popular. Uh, Like I said, I haven't read the book. Maybe one day, if I just read 10 pages a day, I'll finally get through my reading list, and then I'll have time to, to read Atomic Habits. But I think one of the reasons that this book was so popular was that idea of this, these little changes being a vote for the kind of person you one day hope to become. Because that idea connects the things we do to who we are, to our identity, to who we wish to someday become. And that idea of identity is is at the, the heart of what our society is talking about right now. Everyone is talking about identity. If you listen for it, you'll you'll start to hear it everywhere. Everyone identifies themselves by some combination of the things that they do, whether it's their career or their appearance, or their friends, whether it's their family, or their ethnicity, or their work ethic, whether it's their political party that they align with, or the people that they follow online, all of us are looking for identity 
all around us. This is what, what people are talking about. And, and that's why that book was so popular, because it, it connected the things we do to the people we want to be. All of us, by nature, are, are searching for an identity, to give our lives meaning and purpose. We want to know who we really are. That's what people are looking for. And so this, this idea that, that there is this, this better you, this better identity for you somewhere out there, if you just make these incremental changes over the course of time, that idea really appealed to people. Well, in Romans 6 today, Paul is going to take that idea and, and flip it on its head. He's going to tell you that, that you have a better identity, your true identity, right now. And it's not something that you have to go out and work for. It's not something that you have to make incremental changes in your life to one day achieve. It's something that's true of you right here and right now. It's the identity that was given to you in your baptism. He tells us what that identity is in the last verse. He says, our identity is dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so that's what Paul is going to refocus us on today. With all the things going on around us, so often we get distracted from it. But today, Paul brings that back into focus, places it in front of us, and says, this is who you are. You're dead to sin and alive to God. So we're going to talk about what that means first, and then we'll talk about what it means for us in our lives. First, Paul starts this section with a question that I think all of us have, have wondered about at one point or another in our lives. We may, might not have put it in these exact words, but he asks this question, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? It's a a question that I think we all wonder about because Paul has just in the verses previous to this, he's just explained how amazing and immeasurable God's grace is. He tells us in his words, where sin abounds, grace, and then he makes up a word here, grace super abounds. He says you can't out sin God's grace. If you sin, God, God's grace is always bigger than your sin. It doesn't matter what that sin is. It doesn't matter who you are. You cannot out-sin the grace of God. God will never stop loving you. He will never stop forgiving you. No matter what you've done, there is still more of God's forgiveness for you. That's an amazing, comforting truth that Paul has just laid out in Romans chapter 5 and and you wish that he could just end the letter right there, right? But Paul knows us better than that. He knows human nature, and he knows that when he tells us about this immeasurable love that we can't possibly out sin, there's a part of us as human beings that takes that as a challenge. That says, oh yeah, well I'm just going to go out and sin as much as I want because God's got my back, right? There's a part of us that starts trying to poke holes in that. That says, well, that doesn't make any sense. If God's just going to forgive us anyway, why should I care what his word says? Why, why should I try to do what his word commands? Why should I try to follow his rules? I mean, he does want that, right? We start trying to give him advice. Like, God, if you want people to obey you, here's how you do it. Like, if you want your kids to clean your room, you don't say, all right, kids, your room really needs to be cleaned, and whether you do it or not, I'm going to still love you afterwards, and I will forgive you even if you don't do what I say, right? We don't, we don't talk like that to our kids. You don't talk like that to the people you work with who, who need to get you something by a deadline, right? No, you put fear into them. You say, kids, clean up your room or else, right? And so we, we look at this from God and how he says, my love is, is immeasurable. My grace for you will, will always go beyond your sin. And we think, God, you can't tell that to people like us. You know what we're going to do with that, right? Doesn't he want us to follow his laws? But that just goes to show how completely opposite our way of thinking is to God. We are always so concerned with making sure that the rules get followed. And we assume that God is too, that God's ultimate goal up there in heaven is just to create a bunch of people who follow all, the, all of his rules, right? Because somewhere deep down, 
we believe that it's our obedience, our rule following, that earns us God's love. Somewhere deep down, we believe that, that we might not be there yet, but if we just make these tiny incremental changes, these little votes every day for the kind of person that God wants us to be, then maybe someday we'll be a person worthy of God's love. But that's not what Paul says, right? Paul asks that question, should we go on sinning? And he says no. He says no, you shouldn't go on sinning, but he doesn't say it because you need to be afraid of what God's going to do to you. He doesn't say you can't go on sinning or else God is going to get you. He says no, you don't go on sinning because of who you are, because of your identity. Because that part of you that would take advantage of God's grace, that old self is dead. You are dead to sin. That's what he tells you happened in your baptism. He lists all those things. At your baptism, you were buried with Christ. You were crucified with Christ. You were baptized into his death. All of these things that show you what happened when that water was poured over your head. And God's name was spoken over you. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When that happened, that old person, that old you, died. And a new person was brought to life. And just as miraculous of a resurrection as Jesus rising from the grave on Easter morning, a new person was born when that happened. He said, this is what happened in your baptism this is your identity. This is your identity that is given to you, not earned by your obedience. This is your identity that is fixed, that is not fluctuating based on your performance or how other people view you. This is your identity that comes from outside of you, not from inside. This is who you are. This is your truest and best identity. You are a dearly loved child of God. And even if it doesn't feel like that right now, that's the truth. That is the reality. That is your identity in Christ. That's what he says, that all of this happens through baptism, and he says all of this happens in Christ. You look at all the times that he brings that up in this section. He talks about being baptized into Christ, into his death, being crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, over and over and over, he brings this up again and again to show you that the power in baptism doesn't come from some special water or some magic words that are, are combined in a, a, a ritual. The, the reason that baptism has power is it's because it's connected to Christ. It's connected to his word. What happens in baptism is that that water connected to God's word washes every stain of sin from you. It washes it away and it unites you with Christ. So intimately that, that everything that was his becomes yours. His perfect life is yours. His death on the cross is the death that your sins deserve. His burial in the grave was the burial of your sin, proving that it's really dead. And his resurrection from the grave on Easter morning is your resurrection to a new life. This is what happened in baptism. This is what it means that you are dead to sin. That now that that has happened to you, your relationship with sin is one where you say, no, you're, you're dead to me, sin. I want nothing to do with you. But you're alive to God. You want everything to do with God. You want to hear his word. You want to do what it says. You want to be surrounded by people who also love God and his word. This is what it means for us to be dead to sin and alive to God. But I know what you're thinking. If that's the case, why do I still struggle so much with sin? There are an awful lot of times that I don't feel like I'm dead to sin. It's, it's right there. It's still there with me, right? If... If I am dead to sin and alive to God, why does it so often feel like I do take advantage of God's grace? Like I do try to, to carve out my own identity apart from what God says of me in his word. Well, the fact is, 
that while all of the things that happen in baptism are true, they are the reality right now. Your, your sin is dead. You are a new person created by God to live a, a holy life in him. All of that is true. When God looks at you right now, that is how he sees you. He sees you as, as perfectly as Christ lived in your place. And yet, while we live here on this earth, we do still have that, that old person, that old self, as Paul calls it, inside of us. So now we have two people in us. We have the new creation and we have the old self and they are constantly battling out in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. See, your old self wants you to believe that the, the identity, or wants you to doubt the, the reality of the identity that you've been given in baptism. Your old self wants you to carve out your own identity apart from what God says in his word. It wants you to, to think that, that what you do or that, that the things you're interested in or the, the performance that, that you give at work, how productive you are, how good of a parent you are, how you compare to the people around you, it wants you to think that those are what define you as a person. It wants you to think that, that there is no way that anyone, God included, will ever love you unless you're productive enough at work. Unless you're as attractive as the people that you see on Instagram. Unless, you're, unless your kids are, are little angels that prove how good of a parent you are. Right? This is what you're tempted to believe. This is what all of us are tempted to believe every day. See, in, in reality, what happens is this. It's not our actions that create our identity. It's our identity that creates our actions. See, at the heart of every sinful thought, word, and action is a failure to realize the reality of that identity that you've been given in Christ. At the heart of every sinful word and action is, is thinking that we would be better off trying to find our identity in the things we do rather than in the identity that God has given us. And so... That's why it's so easy to, to wake up in the morning and let the first thing you see be your email inbox. Because you believe that what you do and how productive you are and the people that rely on you, that those things are where your identity comes from. That's why it's so easy to, to put way too much pressure on how your kids behave or what they achieve because we think as parents that that our children reflect on us and how good or bad of a parent we are is our true identity. That's why there's so much pressure to advance in your career, to get a bigger house and a nicer car, to wear better clothes, to advance in everything. That's why there's so much constant pressure on everything we do because we're constantly trying to advance ourselves faster than the people around us thinking that that is where our identity is found. It creates this unbearable pressure on our lives. And that's why God doesn't leave it up to us to create our own identity. That's why he doesn't tell us that our identity comes from what we do, because if it did, we would be forced to admit that all the times that we've doubted God, all the times that we've tried to carve out our identity apart from him, all the times that we have blatantly taken advantage of God's grace, all of those things would disqualify us from being his dearly loved children. But because our identity is given to us by grace and not earned, we can be confident that the identity he gives us in baptism really is who we are. This is what's so amazing about baptism. You saw Hallie up here this morning. She, she played almost no part in her baptism. I mean, she looked great. Don't get me wrong. She, she did a great job looking adorable. But baptism is something that happens to you. It's something where God is doing all of the action, where he is giving you a new identity where he is showing you that your identity is not something you have to go out and earn for yourself, 
It's not something you can achieve someday if you just try hard enough. It's something that's yours right now by grace through faith in Christ. This is what we get to remember every single day. This is what we need to be reminded of every single day, that you are God's child, whom he loves, and in you he is well pleased. He wants you to know that, and that's why he, he can't wait to hear from you in prayer. You're his child that he can't wait to speak to through his word. You're his child that he wants to reassure of his presence through his body and blood and the Lord's Supper. This is all God wants for you, to know what your true identity is, that you are his dearly loved child. And so do we go on sinning knowing that? Of course we don't, right? That part of us is dead. While sin is, is still with us as long as we're here on earth, that is no longer our identity. Our identity is dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And through his word, through his sacraments, through his spirit working in our hearts, he wants to strengthen your faith in that identity little by little every single day. To strengthen your faith in him so that you're confident in your identity. He wants to reassure you of that through his word and his sacraments. And, and, and so you spend 15 minutes in his word tomorrow, being reminded of your identity. When you wake up on Tuesday, you might not notice that much of a difference. But you spend 15 minutes reading his word, being reminded of your identity every single day for the next year, I think you'll be amazed how much more confident you are in your identity how much less anxious you are and more at peace, how much less attached to the things of this world and more aware that those things are not what define you and what give you your identity. Because your identity is given, it's not earned. It's fixed, it's not fluctuating, and it comes from without, not from within. Your identity as a baptized child of God is dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. God give you strength to live by that identity every day of your lives. Amen.